Hello, and welcome again to Classic Film, Montgomery Clift, and Other Great Actors Podcasts. I want to remind you, you can also check out my website for classic film blogs at Classic Film, Montgomery Clift, and Other Great Actors, and also check out my YouTube channel under Classic Film, Montgomery Clift, and Other Great Actors. Today, we are going to be talking about King Vidor. King Vidor, Ruler of the Reels. King Vidor was a visionary artor director from the golden age of Hollywood. Beginning in the silent era, King's films always bring realism and often a sense of spirituality. King came to California with only some change in his pocket and left behind a legacy of powerful films. King Vidor, The Beginnings King Wallace Vidor, yes, his name was actually King, was born February 8, 1894, in Galveston, Texas. He was fortunate to survive the hurricane of 1900, which devastated Galveston and killed a third of its population. He witnessed dead people and animals strewn throughout the town. This may have had an unconscious effect in his films, as many of his films dealt with tragedy. His family was rather well-to-do and also rather religious, Christian scientists. This is also evidenced in his films, but he is not heavy-handed about religion. It often comes across in the morality of the character trying to stay on the right path. Our King was an enterprising young lad with a great imagination. He was interested in cameras and photography as a young boy. As a teenager, when nearby music store owner decided to begin showing these, quote, newfangled moving pictures, end quote, King was the first one in line for a job. He was given the position of ticket taker. The, quote, theater, end quote, called Nickelodeon, King worked in was most primitive, showing one or two reelers, 15 to 30 minutes of film. These were often French films, comedies done in pantomime. King worked 12-hour days and saw the same films over and over. He also had to take over for the projectionist at lunch, a dangerous task, as the equipment was a serious fire hazard. However, King was enthralled. King Vidor, Early Documentary Film King's friends were also obsessed with motion pictures, one of his friends constructing a very rough camera. With this, he and King filmed a hurricane demolishing some buildings in Galveston, which they actually showed at local theaters. King was ready to move on to even bigger projects. In 1912, the army was assembling to march from Galveston to Houston as a show of military strength to Mexico. King immediately saw an opportunity and wrote to Mutual Weekly in New York. King suggested he could be the Texas correspondent and would film the event. He neglected to mention he did not have a camera. Such things as not having a camera did not phase King Vidor. He wrote to Chicago to order some film, asking if they knew anyone in the state of Texas who owned a camera. As luck would have it, a chauffeur in Houston had a camera, so off went King to find him. Announcing himself as correspondent for Mutual Weekly, he offered to share in the money from the film in return for use of the camera. The chauffeur, one John Boggs, agreed. Mutual Weekly did use the footage and distributed it throughout the country. King Vidor then went on to make his first film called In Tow, 1913, with John Boggs and his camera. The film was about the local auto races. Despite the film being rather crudely made and not of especially good quality, it did show in the area. King also met a young lady during this filming named Florence Arto. He would go on to marry Florence in 1915. King must have gained a bit of a reputation as a filmmaker because in 1914, a man named Ed Sedgwick turned up asking to partner with King. Ed was from a family of vaudevillians and did a lot of physical comedy stunts a la Buster Keaton. King and Ed made a couple one and two reelers together, but the distributing company they contracted with went bankrupt. Ironically, Ed would go on to California and would wind up directing Buster Keaton in several films. King Vidor Goes to Hollywood After receiving profits of $85 from one of his films, King put a down payment on a Model T Ford. 
He then packed up the film organization, Florence, new partner Cliff Vick, and all the equipment to begin a six-week journey to California. The trip was fraught with trouble, from constantly blowing out tires, with no replacements available, to tangling with a group of gypsies who were attempting to rob them. Nevertheless, the group managed to finally arrive in San Francisco on their last couple dollars. Fortunately, Florence managed to secure a contract with Vitagraph. King sold scenarios, a sort of primitive screenplay, filmed newsreels, and did extra work. Eventually, King was given a job at Universal. Though hardly a great beginning, he was relegated to a company clerk. However, this position did give him the opportunity to observe directors at the studio. King was not the sort of man to sit around and do some bookkeeping. He had a con artist type side to him and began to write scenarios under an assumed name, placing them with all the other scenarios. He was eventually found out and fired. However, the quality of his scenarios were considered and he was rehired to write comedy shorts. Sadly, Universal decided to do away with the comedies shortly thereafter and King was again out of a job. In the early days of Hollywood, all sorts of folks were making films. King would be contracted by a gentleman who went by the title of Judge Willis Brown. Judge Brown would ask King to make a series of shorts wherein the judge would reform groups of young delinquents. The morality of these films appealed to King and, oddly enough, to the general public. Nevertheless, King was ready to move forward in his filmmaking career. If you'd like to see a surviving video of this Judge Willis Brown short, you can go to the website and the blog and there's a link you can click that shows surviving video of one of these shorts. King Vidor Foray into Features King made efforts to be considered as a feature film director with studios but to no avail. He created a feature film story with a strong Christian science flavor to it. A dentist who had backed some of the Judge Brown shorts was interested and collected a group of other dentists and doctors to finance the film. This film was called The Turn of the Road, 1919, and was King's first feature film. The film was released by Robertson Cole, which was a precursor to RKO, and grossed $365,000. King would go on to make four more films for the dentists-slash-doctors, known as the Brentwood Film Corporation. Three were comedies starring a young girl he met on the subway known as Zazu Pitts. Though King would afterward end his relationship with Brentwood Film Corporation, these films helped both Zazu Pitts and King's careers tremendously. Vidor Village With the financial backing from his father, King created his own studio and formed his own production company called, cleverly enough, King Vidor Productions. He had backing from First National out of New York. He called his studio and subsequent sets Vidor Village. King now set about to create his type of films, beginning with The Jackknife Man, 1920. However, the extreme realism in this film did not go over especially well, at least with First National. King would then endeavor to create more Hollywood-style films that would be popular with the public. Despite adapting to create films that would be popular with the public, he never really lost that inherent realism in his characters. King made several films at Vidor Village, such as The Family Honor, 1920, The Sky Pilot, 1921, Love Never Dies, 1921, Real Adventure, 1922, Dusk to Dawn, 1922, and Conquering the Woman, 1922. Florence would often star in his films. Also, a young star named Colleen Moore would feature in Sky Pilot. Supposedly, King and Colleen had a long affair during this film. In 1922, Vidor Village went bankrupt, which would begin King's journey to mega stardom. Metro slash Goldwyn Studios King was asked to direct a film for Metro called Peg of My Heart, starring Laurette Taylor, who was a great stage actress. She had performed the play on the stage for many years. King was not used to directing an established actor, nor was he used to working with someone else's material. Regardless, the film was a success, and again, King was rumored to have had some involvement with Miss Taylor. 
King would go on to make Happiness 1923 again with Taylor and The Woman of Bronze 1923 for Metro before being hired by the Goldwyn Company. His first project would be Three Wise Fools 1923, which would star Eleanor Boardman and William Haynes. King was, as usual, drawn to his leading lady. Whether he became involved with her during this particular film is not known. However, in 1924, Florence divorced King. King went on to make Wild Oranges 1924 for the Goldwyn Company before the merger between Metro and Goldwyn Company, forming MGM. MGM and King Vidor Blockbusters Things didn't necessarily just come together for King Vidor. He directed several films that weren't especially notable. King began to feel he wasn't making films that mattered. He was not writing and producing his own films anymore and was directing what he was given. Irving Thalberg, who was director of production at MGM, asked King what he had in mind. King suggested a scenario of a young man who goes to war and his experiences. Thalberg called in a writer named Lawrence Stallings, who had written a play called What Price Glory and had, in fact, lost a leg in the war himself. Between King and Stallings, a film was created that could be considered one of the best silent films ever. The Big Parade, 1925 The most unfortunate thing about The Big Parade is that it was not made after 1927 and therefore could not win an Academy Award. Undoubtedly, it would have won Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Director. It's that good of a film. However, the Academy Awards didn't come into existence until 1929. The studio paired King Vidor up with their up-and-coming young star, John Gilbert. John and King worked very well together and, in fact, became quite good friends. The film was a phenomenal success, with both critics and audiences, in fact, being considered one of the greatest of the silent era. It would influence other directors such as G.W. Pabst and Lewis Milestone, as well as future directors such as David Lean. There are some clips from the big parade on the website and blog. John Gilbert plays a young man who is not overly interested in going to war. His mother does not want him to go at all. However, he sees a band in town marching and is overcome with the patriotic atmosphere and the pleas of his friends and joins up. While in France with the army, he meets a French girl, Renée Adori, and they fall in love. Unfortunately, he has to go to the battleground with the army and is literally torn from her arms. It's a very moving scene. Another extremely impactful scene shows him in the midst of the battle running into an enemy soldier. They are both wounded, but John's character crawls after the slowly retreating soldier and follows him into a ditch. He has planned to kill the soldier, but suddenly finds he doesn't have the heart. I beg you to see the big parade. It's a wonderful film and very worthy of all the accolades. Sadly for King, the fast-talking con men at MGM managed to convince him to take a lump sum payment for his work on the big parade instead of the 20% of the profits he had been entitled to. This film went on to make over $18 million. King Vidor and John Gilbert The big parade was so successful that MGM teamed John Gilbert and King Vidor up for their next two films. The first of these was another wonderful film called La Boheme, 1926, which starred D.W. Griffith, Protégé, and Phenomenon, Lillian Gish. This was Lillian's first film with MGM. From the beginning of the film, it was clear Lillian was the person in power, arranging things the way they had been done with D.W. Griffith. King himself was a huge fan of D.W. and was willing to try something new. However, after a while... He informed Lillian that, although he respected D.W. Griffith tremendously, he liked to do films his own way. Lillian took this in stride and allowed King to take over directing the film. Both Lillian Gish and John Gilbert were two very popular silent film stars that saw their careers ruined by MGM. Lillian was lucky enough to revive her career later on. John was not. You can read both of their stories in their respective blogs on the website or listen to their podcasts. You can see clips of La Boheme on either of their blogs. 
La Boheme was another big hit for King Vidor, but perhaps a slight disappointment to both King and John in the romance department. The two notorious ladies' men could get nowhere with the beautiful Lillian Gish. King's last film with John would be Bardley's The Magnificent, 1926, where he would have much more success with his leading lady, Eleanor Boardman. They were married in 1926, which suggested they had probably been involved prior to this film, perhaps since Three Wise Fools. The Last of the Silence The Crowd, 1928 King felt his formula in the big parade of a man going through a battle and observing and reacting to experiences could be successfully replicated. However, instead of dealing with the war, the man would just deal with life and day-to-day living. Hence, the crowd was born. The main point of the film was that the leading actor should be an average Joe. Hence, King did not want a star in the role. He scoured the MGM lot for average Joe types. He finally found an extra named James Murray who fit this description. To his astonishment, James Murray was quite dismissive when King approached him for the lead role in his film. In fact, King was forced to track him down and then pay him to come in and talk about the film. Further, when asked to do a screen test, James Murray informed King he would only do so if paid. This was not generally how extras treated being practically handed leading roles, but King was now more determined than ever to have him in the film. James got his paid screen test and King got his star. Ironically, James Murray turned out to be absolutely amazing in the film. Eleanor Boardman was cast as the wife. The film was the epitome of the King Vidor realism, the kind of films he was originally putting together like The Jackknife Man. The film depicts the daily struggle of a person going through life, working at a mundane job, and struggling with his family. There are some scenes on the blog from the crowd. This film was highly acclaimed and did garner an Oscar nomination for King Vidor. However, again, the public was not so pleased with the depressing realism of King Vidor. It did not do especially well at the box office, and MGM quickly sent King on a new direction. Another very sad note about this film is that actor James Murray was found floating in a river in 1936 at the age of 35. He was apparently an alcoholic and practically homeless towards the end. A great talent wasted. King Vidor, Screwball Comedies? As mentioned, MGM wanted King to go in a different direction and had him working with, and had him working with Marion Davies in some comedies. These would be his last couple silent films. These films were The Patsy, 1928, and Show People, 1928. Show People was actually a spoof of his own film, Bardley's The Magnificent. These are delightful and funny films, especially Show People, which features many cameos from different silent film stars. However, these were not the kind of films King Vidor wished to make. To a New Era, Talkies. Hallelujah, 1928. Hallelujah had a lot of distinctions. It was King Vidor's first talkie. It was also the first all-black cast in a Hollywood feature film. In a way, it was pioneering for the time. In fact, King Vidor had been wanting to do a film with an all-black cast for some time. King had grown up in Texas and his father had owned sawmills and employed many black workers. He was impressed with their religious beliefs and their spiritual and soulful songs. Unfortunately, he also viewed them as very simple folk, which does translate in the film to that stereotypic, stupid black person. With accents and behavior very similar to Prissy in Gone with the Wind, it can be rather offensive. In fact, the film shows this message in the beginning. Quote, The films you are about to see are a product of their time. They may reflect some of the prejudices that were commonplace in American society, especially when it came to the treatment of racial and ethnic minorities. These depictions were wrong then and are wrong today. These films are being presented as they were originally created because to do otherwise would be the same as claiming these prejudices never existed. While the following certainly does not represent Warner Brothers' opinion in today's society, these images do accurately reflect a part of our history that cannot and should not be ignored. It was incredibly difficult to convince the heads of MGM to make such a film, racism being extremely rampant in those days. 
However, King put his salary up as collateral for the film and MGM shrugged their shoulders and let him go ahead. The film itself is a story of a man trying to toe the line and do what is right, but he keeps getting sidetracked by temptations. He is seduced by a bad woman who is in league with a con artist gambler. They take all the money he has just earned for the whole season. He tries to shoot the man, but accidentally winds up shooting his own brother who has come to look for him. He falls into great despair. There are some video clips from Hallelujah on the block. This film was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Director for King Vidor. It was also originally created as a silent film and sound was added in, which also may be why there is a bit of over-the-topness with the acting. There's a really cool scene where they show a band playing with a very impressive drummer, and it must be noted this film also featured music from Irving Berlin. The Champ, 1931. A heart-rending film, beautifully acted, The Champ is a masterpiece. The film revolves around a single father and his son. The father, Wallace Beery, is a down-and-out former boxer, now gambler and alcoholic, trying his best to raise his son, Dink. Dink is played by the incomparable Jackie Cooper. The Oscar for Best Actor should definitely have been given for this film, but it should have gone to Jackie Cooper rather than Wallace Beery. The story is very reminiscent of Charlie Chaplin's The Kid. Dink's mother comes into town for a horse race and inadvertently runs into Dink, not knowing he's her son. She winds up realizing later on when she sees him with his father. She then wants Dink to come live with her since she can provide a better life for him. There are clips from The Champ on the website and I would highly recommend checking them out. The Champ, Wallace Beery, has told Dink, Jackie Cooper, that he will get him a horse and manages to do so on a good run of gambling luck. Dink enters the horse into a race and it nearly wins, except it stumbles and falls. Dink is devastated and the Champ comforts him. This is when Dink's mother spots the Champ and realizes Dink is their son. The mother bribes the Champ to let Dink come and see her. She then reveals to him that she's his mother. There's a really devastating scene where the champ is convinced he's a terrible father and Dink is better off without him. He does what he can to try to make Dink want to leave him. I find that particular scene absolutely heartbreaking. Again, King Vidor was nominated for Best Director and again did not win, making it three for three. King Vidor's next film, Bird of Paradise, 1932, was notable because of a young script girl named Elizabeth Hill. The film was shot in Hawaii, and I suppose the location was quite romantic. Eleanor and King were divorced in 1931, which allegedly happened after returning from the making of this film. The timeline is suspect considering Elizabeth and King were married in 1932. Other notable films. I'm not going to go through the remainder of King Vidor's films, but I will point out ones I think are notable and particularly like. If there are ones you think I missed, please let me know in the comments. Stella Dallas, 1937. Another film with a similar story to The Champ. This time it's a single mother and a daughter. This film stars the great Barbara Stanwyck in perhaps one of her best roles. Both Barbara and Anne Shirley, who played the daughter, were nominated for Academy Awards, but neither won. Stella, Barbara, is a common girl who manages to marry a rich high society man. Unfortunately, instead of acquiring some finesse in class, she dresses very gaudily and becomes obsessed with the idea of befriending the right people. It begins to cause a strain in the marriage. There are clips of Stella Dallas on the website. They wind up splitting up and Stella raises her daughter alone with monetary help from the father. Eventually, the daughter, Laurel, is sent to visit with her father and her stepmother to be able to mingle in good society. Laurel does find new friends, but things go badly when Stella comes to visit her. She overhears the friends making fun of her and thinks she's an embarrassment to her daughter. Very similar to the champ, Stella tries to pretend she doesn't want Laurel anymore so that she will go live with her father and stepmother so she can have a better life. The most heartbreaking scene in the film, Stella has to watch from the street as her daughter gets married. The Citadel, 1938 It's hard to go wrong when you have Robert Donat as your leading man. Just a mere year before his Oscar-winning performance in Goodbye Mr. Chips, 1939, Robert turns in possibly an even better performance as Dr. Manson in The Citadel. 
This film was nominated for four Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Actor, Robert Donat, and Best Director, King Vidor. It was also nominated for Best Screenplay, and Elizabeth Hill was one of the writers on the screenplay. Unfortunately, no one won. King loved working with Robert Donat, calling him the, quote, most helpful and cooperative star with whom I have ever worked, end quote, and saying, quote, I have observed no finer actor than Donat, end quote. Indeed, there are few actors who can make the character transition so smoothly and subtly as Robert Donat. There are clips from The Citadel on the website. Dr. Manson is an ideal-minded young physician. He is given a job in a small town and meets with a like-minded friend also in the medical field. He has to deal with a lot of ignorance from the simple country folk who don't understand medicine. He has also met a teacher in the village played by Rosalind Russell. Dr. Manson is offered a job in a coal mining town as the resident doctor. Eager to gain such a position, he is deflated to find out they want a married man. He then returns to the village and convinces Rosalind to marry him. While in the coal mining town, he discovers the miners have a strange cough and wants to further investigate. He also refuses to issue work releases to miners who are not actually ill in any way but are just malingerers. This angers the miners. They don't like his fancy ideas about their lung ailments. They go about to destroy the lab he's created in his house and destroy all the guinea pigs he's doing experiments on. After leaving this position, he goes to London and gets hooked up with a very cushy practice where he has mostly rich women clients. He doles out whatever is necessary to get payments from them. His wife is horrified at his new lack of ethics, but Dr. Manson has been swayed by money and power. In fact, his old friend from the village, Denny, played by Ralph Richardson, comes to beg for assistance on a project and is shocked at the new attitude of his old friend. After a tragedy, Dr. Manson has finally realized what he has become and is devastated. He considers throwing himself off the bridge. I think this scene is the most moving in the film. A separate note, I found it interesting that King Vidor did some directing in The Wizard of Oz. He actually directed the cyclone scene. Duel in the Sun, 1946. This film boasts a really great ensemble cast and is a beautifully filmed Technicolor Western. David O. Selznick was producer on this film and there's a reminiscent Gone with the Wind quality to it. David O. Selznick was a real pain as a producer. He would constantly micromanage everything, practically directing the picture himself. He would write obnoxiously long memos to the director daily. He also dragged his wife, Jennifer Jones, into most of his films. In this film, she plays a half-Mexican girl, face dirtied up to look Mexican, I guess. She doesn't look Mexican at all, just dirty. However, the cast around her consists of some excellent actors, including Joseph Cotton, Lillian Gish, Lionel Barrymore, Charles Bickford, and Gregory Peck in a surprisingly villainous role. There are clips from Duel in the Sun on the website. Pearl, Jennifer Jones, has been sent to live with Laura Bell, Lillian Gish, after her father is hanged for murdering her mother and her mother's lover. Laura Bell was an old love of her father's. Laura Bell's son, Jesse, Joseph Cotton, has been sent to bring her home from the station. Very unfortunately, she has stumbled into an extremely dysfunctional family. Jesse and Laura Bell are decent and kind, but Laura Bell's husband, Lionel Barrymore, is hateful. He resents her because he knows Laura Bell loved her father and is jealous. Their other son, Lute, Gregory Peck, is a complete sociopath who has no qualms about forcing himself on Pearl. The railroad line is being built through their land as granted by the government. The father, Senator McCandless, rides out with all his men to put a stop to this. He is met by an old friend who is on the side of the railroad, Harry Carey, who tries to reason with him. Jesse also sides against him, causing the senator to throw him out of the house. Meanwhile, while everyone is out, Lute takes advantage of the situation to force himself on Pearl. After Jesse leaves, Pearl really has no protection. She is convinced Lute will marry her, but when he suggests it to his father, his father flips out. This causes Lute to change his mind and tells her he won't marry her. She retaliates by finding another man, Charles Bickford. He has agreed to marry Pearl, but Lute won't have it. Lute is now an outlaw wanted for murder. 
Laura Bell is devastated by what has happened with her sons. She refuses to get rid of Pearl and defies her husband. She's also quite ill. Both Jennifer Jones and Lillian Gish were nominated for Academy Awards for this film. Neither won. The Fountainhead, 1949. The Fountainhead is another King Vidor film where the main character is up against a corrupt society trying to force him to abandon his integrity and conform. Gary Cooper plays Howard Rourke, a modern architect in a world of classic architects that feel threatened by his cutting-edge designs. The whole world is against him, and yet he refuses to give up. There are scenes from The Fountainhead on the website. Howard winds up meeting the daughter of one of these classic architects. Her name is Dominique. She's played by Patricia Neal, who has a column on the banner, a sensationalist newspaper. When they meet, he is working as a laborer on one of her father's projects. She is a person who doesn't wish to be under the power of any person, especially any man. She doesn't want to love anyone or anything because she feels it will give them a power over her. She and Howard wind up hooking up and he quickly leaves her because he has finally been asked to design a building. However, the folks at the banner are engaging in a smear campaign to discredit Rourke's new building. Dominique loves the building's design and is unaware that the architect is actually the man she was involved with. She discovers that when attending a party in the new building. There is a lot of chemistry between Gary Cooper and Patricia Neal as they were having an affair during the filming of this movie. The smear campaign is successful and Howard is again temporarily ruined. Dominique marries her powerful boss, Gail Wynan, who is played by Ray Massey, head of the banner. It is said that the character of Gail Wynan was based on William Randolph Hearst. Without knowing the history of Dominique and Howard, Gail invites him to design their new home. Gail takes a liking to Howard for his strength of character and integrity. Eventually, the classic architects again try to destroy Howard, but this time, Gail tries to take a stand to help him and go against the public. However, he is too weak and gives in. This film was not nominated for any awards, but I particularly like it. Many people think it's Gary Cooper's best role. War and Peace, 1956. King Vidor undertakes Leo Tolstoy. This film may not necessarily be the most faithful or the best adaptation of the book, but it is a wonderful film. The cinematography in this film is very well done by great cinematographer Jack Cardiff. In fact, Jack Cardiff was nominated for an Oscar for this film. King Vidor was again nominated and didn't win, making him 0 for 5 in Oscars, which is really quite ridiculous. This film has an excellent cast of actors, though the lead characters seem miscast. Henry Fonda plays Pierre, and while I think Henry Fonda is an amazing actor, I don't think this is the role for him. He does a very good job in the film, as he always does. I just never feel he is right for the character. Also, he seems far too old for the character. Audrey Hepburn is Natasha, and again, I just think it an odd role for her, though she gives a wonderful performance. Her husband, Mel Farrar, plays Prince Andre, and his stiffness works for this particular role. There's a slew of wonderful secondary actors in this. Vittorio Gassman, Herbert Lohm as Napoleon, Helmut Dantine and John Mills in a particularly touching role. In fact, I love John Mills. There are clips from War and Peace on the website. Pierre has married a beautiful but very conniving woman who dallies with his friends. This forces Pierre to challenge his friend Dolokhov, Helmut Dantine, to a duel. Pierre is a pacifist type and is horrified by the entire thing, even more so when he accidentally shoots Dolokhov. Pierre is a close friend of Natasha's family and often joins them on their family outings. Here they run into Prince Andre, Mel Farrar, who has been in mourning for his wife. He is quite taken with Natasha. Prince Andre is sent away to war against the French. Pierre wants to see what the war is like and comes to watch the battle. There are some very beautifully done visuals in this particular scene. The Russian commander of the armed forces is very smart in dealing with Napoleon. They arrive at empty cities with nothing left. It disheartens Napoleon, and they are also low on food and supplies. They try to trek back to France, but struggle mightily in the Russian winter. Critics liked War and Peace, but American audiences were not so impressed. However, it was very popular in Russia, which is not too surprising. 
Solomon and Sheba 1959 was King Vidor's last film, and sadly also the last film of Tyrone Power, who died during production at age 45. He was replaced by Yul Brenner, who King Vidor did not care for. Yul Brenner was playing the role in his usual dominant way without any of the character nuances that Tyrone Power had implemented. King Vidor Retires After this film, King Vidor simply walked away from filmmaking. He did try to do some projects in later years, but they were all abandoned or did not come to fruition. In 1978, King and Elizabeth were divorced. In 1979, King finally received a long-deserved Academy Award. He received the honorary Oscar, which is what they give to folks who were wrongly snubbed for numerous Oscars and live long enough to make the Academy feel guilty. Peter O'Toole is another such recipient. It should be noted that King also wrote an autobiography called A Tree is a Tree, which is fascinating, hilarious, and I would highly recommend. In fact, much of the information in this podcast was derived from that book. Very entertaining. King Vidor died of a heart attack on November 1st, 1982. He was 88 years old. When King Vidor was first starting out at Vidor Village, he published a document called, quote, Creed and Pledge, end quote, which I want to leave you with. Quote, I believe in the motion picture that carries a message to humanity. I believe in the picture that will help humanity to free itself from the shackles of fear and suffering that have so long bound it in its chains. I will not knowingly produce a picture that contains anything that I do not believe to be absolutely true to human nature, anything that could injure anyone or anything unclean in thought or action. Nor will I deliberately portray anything to cause fright, suggest fear, glorify mischief, condone cruelty, or extenuate malice. I will never picture evil or wrong except to prove the fallacy of its line. So long as I direct pictures, I will make only those founded on the principles of right, and I will endeavor to draw upon the inexhaustible source of good for my stories my guidance, and my inspiration. End quote. This is the end of King Vidor, Ruler of the Reels. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and share my podcast. And as always, check out the website and blog at Classic Film, Montgomery Clift, and other great actors. And we will see you at the next podcast. Thank you.